everyone to our annual Quilt Equals Art Equals Quilt Artist Talks. Um, our Quilt Equals Art Equals Quilts exhibition will be on view October 23rd through January 9th. Our hours are Wednesday through Saturday from 10 to 5 and Sunday 1 to 5. If you can come out and see the exhibition in person, we welcome you to do that. And if not, you can visit our website and check it out online. I'm joined today by um, Ontario artist Fuzzy Mall. Welcome, Fuzzy. Hello. <laughs> And we're here to talk a little bit about the quilt that he has in our exhibit. Um, Fuzzy, can you just tell us a little bit about the piece that will that's on view right now? Uh, Ryan was in town from Montreal uh, where he performs for Cirque du Soleil. He's like a aerial acrobat. He's the guy that flies 50 feet in the air and does flips and things. Um, but at the time, obviously COVID had shut down Cir Cirque, so he was kind of around visiting and uh, just really hit it off with him really quickly. And uh, you can tell like he had a real passion for performing. So basically it was not very difficult to uh, get him to meet me in a park a couple of days later and like put on a big show for me and my daughter. So I just took a bunch of hundreds of photos of him flying through the air and then decided that was the right one, so. Yeah, so you have these um, figures that are sometimes like cut out from their environment, like like mm -hmm. this one, um, and they are in fabric and quilted. So it's a unique way of representing the figure. And and what what do you why do you do it that way in particular? Um, well, the I did a series before this where mm -hmm. I was like getting to know my new city and just doing portraits of strangers. And like, they would nominate the next person. Um, and I did like 25 of those after um, like a year and a half. And I was really like stifled by the, the format that they were in. Like they were just like busts and like occasional hands um, and you know, like the square rectangular format. Uh, so I really wanted to, with my next series, just blow it up and just focus on the whole entire body. Uh, and then, so I knew, I, like, I kind of wanted to just get rid of the background. I'm always, you know, I, I'm always in generally trying to break the that traditional form. So that's what kind of drew me to that. And then uh, with that it comes all kinds of other problems. So I was really looking for different silhouettes and, and that led me to people doing things and then people doing things that bring them happiness and it's kind of snowballed that way. So that whole series was kind of people in action finding their, controlling their own happiness and bliss. Yeah, talk a little bit about the, the notion of happiness and as it connects to the action they're doing, because everyone is, a, a lot of your work, people are in this, in motion. Um, why is that important to portray? Well, a couple of things, like just going back to that prior, prior series, like it was more um, just like documenting these ephemeral moments and trying to like, it was a response to like social media and like the flooding of imagery and just like disposable imagery that we don't actually even like, you know, print off of our phone. Like they're just in the air and lost. So I was trying to, to slow that process down and hand working these, these images. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in that, like just solidifying these fleeting, fleeting moments. Yeah, I can really see that specifically in this piece that we have at the Schweinfurth um, because of that, you know, he's in this upside down sort of almost vulnerable position if you don't, if you're not connected to like why he's in that pose or in that moment. I would, I want the viewer to, um, to have that intimate, like almost voyeuristic experience with, with these other people. Like that's what I'm kind of going for with with that series of work anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, tell us about any new work that you have coming up. Do you have a new series going, different bodies of work? Yeah, I'm just starting. I finished one piece. Um, I kind of have the idea of what I'm going to be doing. And I'm in the middle of writing several grants. So I'm really solidifying <laughs> what I'm going to be doing. Um, so I'm still going to, I still plan on breaking that that square format where the figures will will just be you know cut out um, and I'm sticking to the same similar scale about like 
six to eight feet on these pieces, but the new work is just going to be focused on the face so that I can like really get more detailed. Um, like this guy will probably be, will be part of that. So I'm able, as it gets bigger, I'm able to like go in and really focus on the realism and like, you know, render like the individual hairs or try to get into the pores of the surface of someone. Um, but then after, after it's all done, I plan, well, I am, I'm uh, cutting into the work, into the, and moving the picture plane and moving shapes around the, the surface and then reinterpreting that. Um, the work's gonna be dealing with, with the notion of masks. Um, so I'm gonna play around with both digital and physical and emotional masks that we use um, and then tie that all in together. And then also by, by cutting up, I'm obscuring the view of the actual portrait. And it's kind of the notion of like, as we come out of this pandemic, like, are we even gonna be comfortable seeing someone without a mask or are we more comfortable with the obscured view? So I'm kind of letting, letting the viewer decide on that. Yeah. You really do have a knack for like um, realism, but then you you add in these stylistic details. Is there any reason why realism is important to you? Not, I mean, not in particular. Um, I used to be a painter and I never painted realism at all. Like it just, it's just kind of what's happened to me uh, on my course in textiles. Um, and I have like these goals in my head that I want to reach in to like try to get into like that hyper realism, but like, but constrained by, you know, by fabric. Um, so I think I'm still working to achieve that. Uh, so I'll still keep pushing, but at the same time now I'm going to start getting into more into abstracting these images as well. So yeah. there'll be uh, just a play between the two. So um, it's interesting that you mentioned your background is in painting. How did you come to work in fiber? So at the time I was I was painting and uh, it was it was the winter and my garage, my studio was in a garage separate from the house. It wasn't insulated. So I went out to work on on a project and I found that all of my paint was frozen solid. So um, idle hands. So I needed to do something. <laughs> So I went inside. Um, I'd always been kind of, I've always like hand sewed things like in high school and college. Um, so I decided I wanted to just like make a, make a hoodie for myself. So I made like a simple, simple stencil, like three color stencil of, of James Brown and just cut them out in fabric and just like hand stitched it. Took me, you know, probably like two months to do. <laughs> um, but then it just kind of, after that, I like I, all my friends wanted one. And so I started, you know, I did a few more hand sewed and then I uh, I figured out how to do them faster with the sewing machine. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I always had that kind of like little side hustle going while I was painting as well. And then a few years ago, I just decided that I was gonna pursue textiles and put the paints away. I'm very messy in general. So it's my, my wife was happy with this decision. <laughs> How how artists come to certain methods of working are often um, very practical, and you know you you want to put some grand idea on things, but sometimes it it's like an instinct, and I I always love that you know the paint was yeah. frozen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as, it was as simple as that. But then like now having more perspective and looking back, like I realize like my first paintings had had textiles in them. I was like mm -hmm. quilting and then the mm -hmm. quilting and the figures were the negative space and then those were painted. So um, yeah, my works always dabbled like and lived in like cross between like printmaking and photography and sculpture and, and ceramics too. I like my paint was trying to mimic glaze. Like my wife's a ceramic professor and I thought that's the route that I was gonna go, um, but it didn't work out that way. So, so yeah, craft has always been important in my work. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about your, um, pro the processes you use and how you build your images? Um, yeah. So it's, I start, I always start with photographs. Um, I use all my own imagery. Um, 
at least since since James Brown days of hoodies. So, so yeah, um, I'll start with a, a good proper source photo that I'll take. Um, from there, I use a projector and I'll blow up the image. I'll play around with scale. Um, I always have to like shrink it down a bit because like I tend to like my images, I'll blow up like 20 feet on my wall. I'm like, yes, that's what I need to do. But, you know, so <laughs> they're harder to do. <laughs> After the projection, I'll do a drawing and break down every value change that I can possibly find. Um, a lot of the times I'll, I'll yeah, I just use that as a basic map um, for myself moving forward. And then, uh, yeah, I'll pick a, pick a general palette out from there. I'll have like maybe, you know, 50 to 75 different fabrics kind of out that I think I'll be able to use and I'll, you know, sort them based on value changes. Um, but normally they end up just on, on the floor in a big pile and then just kind of pick and choose and grab. Uh, I use like the uh, heat and bond um, fusible iron-on adhesive. So yeah, that's kind of how I cut everything out, iron it down. And then once everything's tack down in place. Um, I use a satin stitch over every every edge. Why is it important to you? And you talked about earlier, like you're make, you're going to be making these giant portraits where you can really like see every pore and try to get really into hyper realism. Um, why is that level of detail and, and the size important to the what you're trying to get to the viewer? I honestly don't know. Like it's I'm just so drawn to it. Like it's more, you know, it's like a visceral reaction like that I have. Like, I just want to see see them that big. Um, but it also becomes, I don't know, it's it tends to be more impressive for a viewer that might not know, like, just be passing by and seeing something. Um, and it makes them, like, look closer to see what actually is there. But I, I really like the idea and, like, the way that my work will become... Oh, as you back off, it becomes looking like a photo, and then people think it's a painting when they get closer, but then they become very abstract as you get close and like right up on top of it. I remember one, I'd, I had a person um, helping me hang a show the one day, and it was, he was, we hung like 20 pieces of work and we we're just having coffee afterwards. And he, uh, and he asked me, he's like, so why, what, I have, to, I have a question, why is there like thread marks on the back of these paintings? And I just like looked at him like, man, like you've been like holding these for like two hours now. <laughs> like there's no paint in this art center right now. It's all fabric. And, and he was a painter. I have no idea like what he was looking at. <laughs> so yeah, it's just, it's the way the medium works for me. Um, I tend to like to work bigger as well because I feel like I have more control even and I can get more exact detail as things are bigger. Um, pieces that are smaller, like I, I can do them, but I have, I'm struggling throughout the whole process or I'm like consciously aware that, though no, this would be so much bigger, better if it was like 30% bigger. So you have um, circle type pieces. Can you talk a little bit about those? Yeah, so that's uh, my Kill Your Darling series. So um, that first, pro the first major body of work was, um, it was called Phase of Hamilton. That was the one where I was doing strangers that I'd met. Um, so after I'd show that for a while, like the whole time while I was making it, I knew I was going to alter those pieces in some way. So after I was done showing, uh, I decided to cut them up. Um, yeah, kill your darlings. So all of that work is made of old portraits that I'd made. Um, the kind of the idea, I mean, really, I was, I wanted to see it. I knew, I felt like I had to make it. Um, so I was really like a formal exercise. But the way I saw that initial project, um, it was, I saw all these pieces as like one giant quilt and I, I had hung them salon style. So there was like 20 of them all like hang together and it looked like one, one work. So I saw that as like all these individuals creating like one work that would represent a community. And now the pieces, the Kill Your Darlings are like, the the work depends on these individuals to create it like to create that community you know there's a contrast between um the imagery you have behind you with these like 
strip piecing with pattern fabrics versus this, you know, realistic uh, self portrait you have going on over here. Can you talk a little bit about like the traditional elements you are trying to employ or how are you working with that? So the, like this new body of work, um, because I'm, I'm, I'm cutting, cutting into the final piece, um, I'm starting to explore um, and think about the backsides of the piece and incorporating them into the fronts. Um, I did that a little bit on this last piece that I did, and I want to keep pushing that, which will probably lead eventually into like double-sided portraits that will like cut and expose each other. Um, so I just have like a little like color field going on now. Like, um, so most likely the thought was like, I'll sew, I'll sew them together and then, and then cut up. And, uh, so the yellow will eventually like pour, pour through, um, my portrait as well. So mm -hmm. is there anything that I, uh, that you, that's important to your work that I haven't, um, asked you about? Mostly what I use is um, reclaimed textiles. Uh, okay. So like I, I'm always trying to encourage other people to, to take that route. Um, probably about 90% of what I use are like thrift store clothes. Um, so I find that uh, I do it for several reasons. Like one, like the landfill thing. Like I think the average American gets rid of 80 pounds of clothes every year, end up in a landfill. So like environmentally it's best to you know reuse <laughs> mm -hmm. but also like I find that uh it keeps my palette very fresh like once I cut up a shirt I can't rely on that fabric or you know like that pattern or color anymore you know and it's you know very limited use and then because I'm always portraying people like I find like like working with clothes that come from a thrift store like they've been washed and battered and you know hundreds of times it kind of reflects the people that I try to portray rather than like fresh, shiny, you know, straight from the quilt shop, you know, like patterning. So, so I know, I know like my practice is not going to dent any of it, but, but at least like encouraging others, like hopefully it can like help out a little bit. But, That's really interesting. But, I didn't know that. But yeah, but, but really like keeping like that palette fresh is like the, mm -hmm. the biggest thing that you can have. Like, I think, yeah. I don't know, I, I appreciate everyone's work, but sometimes I see, I'll see things. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, kind of looks the same because like the fabrics were the same, like the last couple of times or, you know. Um, yeah, this is why a lot of uh, the quilting artists either use Reclaim or they supplement with hand dyed fabrics because basically it's like creating their own palette. Um, that way they mm. can control and keep the colors fresh because colors and fabric are trendy. There are certain colors and patterns that come out every year. And yeah. sometimes you want something specific. So that's always yeah. um, something I've, I think I've, people, I've, like painters take for granted that they make their own color and fiber artists are always thinking about how they collect color. Yeah, like I, uh, I haven't opened that can of worms cause I know it's like just, it will, it will fully consume me, like dyeing my own fabrics. I don't use any dye or paints on my work. Uh, it's all just applique from what I can find. Yeah. Um, but I find now that I'm starting to, I'm tr there's something there where I'm what, by cutting up my work and then repurposing it, and like I'm creating my own textile in a way. Um, it's my way of dyeing, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm finding new new juxtapositions and are, can be exciting and like, and it's a lot of chance. Um, it's kind of like my way of opening up a kiln and seeing what happens is by like cutting up some things and like sticking them together. And it's like, oh, okay, never would have seen that. Even if I did it like on Photoshop, it's still, it always, it's gonna look different, so. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us today. And if you guys wanna see any more of Fuzzy's work, you can check out his website. And be sure to come in to see the exhibit before it closes January 9th. Thanks, guys. <laughs>